At Staples Business Advantage, our team of experts can help you find the break room products to satisfy everyone's preferences, while AI can suggest popular items, monitor stock levels, optimize pricing, and automate reordering. AI can do a lot of things, but I can never know the taste of a truly great cup of coffee. Sigh. But you also can't get hangry. This is true. Let Staples Business Advantage use today's latest innovations plus our team's experience to make stocking your team's break room easier for you. Sign up today and save 20%. Staples Business Advantage. Business is human. Stocks for beginners. Phil Muscatello and FinPods are authorized reps of Money Sherpa. The information in this podcast is general in nature and doesn't take into account your personal situation. And we have a war in, in Ukraine now. We had a war in Vietnam in the 70s. And we had supply chain disruptions. We had an energy embargo back in the 1970s. We have an energy embargo today, self imposed uh, this time. Mm. So there are very striking similarities uh, in this inflation cycle to what we experienced in the 70s. But I think this inflation cycle has the potential to be much worse for one significant reason uh, the debt levels that we have globally at 350% of GDP today are three and a half times what they were in the 1970s at 100% of GDP. Hi, and welcome back to Stocks for Beginners. I'm Phil Muscatello. What is sustainable mining? How can precious metals be used in a portfolio to provide protection against inflation? To discuss royalties, the mining industry, and reducing the impact of digging up those metals is David Garofalo. Hello, David. Hi, thank you for having me on. Thanks very much for coming on. David Garofalo is the Chief Executive Officer, President and Chairman of the Board of Directors of Gold Royalty. David is a globally recognised Chief Executive with over 30 years of experience in creating and growing multi-billion dollar sustainable mining businesses. So let's get started. We haven't covered um, precious metals for a while on the podcast, um, so let's just do a little bit of a re- revision. What are the main precious metals? Well, we mine or have royalties on mines that have gold and silver principally. Um, we also have a bit of copper as well. I wouldn't consider that a precious metal. It's more of a base metal and one that has a lot of industrial utility, but we have a small amount of exposure to copper as well. And of course, there's also um, platinum and palladium. They're the other main precious metals as well, aren't they? Yeah, they are, but they're not nearly as commoditized as gold and silver are. It's not as liquid a market. It's it's a more of a niche market. Uh, and again, with uh, palladium, there's more of an industrial utilization there. Uh, platinum has more uh, of a jewelry uh, demand angle to it. Uh, but I would say gold and silver have many buyers and many sellers. Uh, so a proper commodity with a proper liquid market, uh, easy to get price discovery, much more difficult in the platinum and palladium uh, side of the business. So the idea of a commodity is that this is something that the price of a commodity can go up and down mm-hmm. um, depending on demand and supply with a lot of volatility, can't it? Yes, it, it, that's absolutely the case, particularly in more liquid and deep markets like gold and silver, uh, where there are many buyers and sellers and, and price discovery can quite often lead to quite a bit of volatility. And that's what you expect from what effectively is a currency. I would say gold is more of a currency than a true commodity. It doesn't really t- trade on uh, traditional demand supply fundamentals like, say, copper or zinc would, uh, because gold has been a monetary instrument for four millennia. And silver has some industrial usages as well, doesn't it? It, it does. And, and important from a decarbonization standpoint, it also has uh, some properties that you know deal with you know, cleansing of water, cleaning of water, for example, sanitation. Um, so it does have a lot more industrial utility than than gold does. Uh, gold is more of a monetary instrument. But that being said, silver tends to trade in tandem with gold. Uh, there's a relationship, a correlation over the long run. Uh, typically, there's a, a relationship in terms of the gold to silver price ratio. In a bull market for precious metals, it tends to narrow to, say, 40 to 1 between the gold and silver price in terms of the ratio between them. In, in a more bearish market, it might widen to 80 to 1. And we've gone through a fairly bearish cycle for precious metals over the last several years, but that's starting to turn around. So silver has the potential to outperform in a rising gold price environment as that ratio tends to narrow. There are some traders, that, aren't there, that use that uh, ratio between the gold and silver price to find entry and exit points for uh, silver especially, don't they? Yeah, it's, it's almost a form of arbitrage, if you will, where they're trying to guess, as, you know, the, the narrowing of that range or the timing of the narrowing of that range, and it tends to provide more torque 
to precious metals up and down. So it's much more volatile for silver than it would be for gold typically because of that play of that ratio and the arbitrage related there too. So you refer to gold as being a store of value, and it's one of those cliches we hear in the industry is that gold has been a store of value for thousands of years. So it's the only precious metal that really has a value in and of itself, doesn't it? Yeah, and that's certainly been the case for many millennia because gold can't be printed unlike many fiat currencies. Uh, and if you think about it, you could go to any country in the world and talk to almost any anybody on earth, and they would under, understand the intrinsic value of gold. Uh, they would accept it as a means of barter. Uh, that's certainly not the case for every fiat currency. Uh, there are many currencies simply that you can't use. Even our Canadian currency, I'm in Canada, and there are many countries where they would look at me funny if I tried to use that as a means of exchange. That you know, That's certainly not the case with the US dollar, but you know, as the Chinese are demonstrating, they're trying to actively destabilize the US dollar as a reserve currency. And what that tells you is really since the beginning of, of time, every fee of currency ever created by man has ultimately failed because the temptation is just too great to debase the value of that currency, which is certainly what's happening in the current economic environment. And the debasement of the currency is really to do with um, the money printing that we've seen over the last few years. And actually, for a long time, governments just tend to keep on spending more money, and that debases or reduces the value of the currency, doesn't it? Yeah, it destroys purchasing power. Uh, If you're printing more of that money, uh, it'll debase the currency. Uh, It'll become more common. And if you look at what's happened since the US dollar was decoupled from the gold standard in the early 1970s, the U.S. dollar has lost about 90% of its purchasing power. So that debasement really has eaten away its savings. And is that a function of inflation, that debasement? Well, it's a function of money printing, which drives inflation. Um, and the reason that the U.S. dollar was decoupled from the gold standard in the early 1970s is Richard Nixon was trying to fund a war in Vietnam. Um, and really what's happened since the great financial crisis is very, very similar to that. There's been a decoupling of fiat currency from any intrinsic value, any backing, physical backing whatsoever to deal with a financial contagion, which has now reared its ugly head again after many years of excess of monetary expansion, 15 years of monetary expansion since the great financial crisis, not just in the US, but on a global coordinated basis across the world. Every central bank has been competing to debase their currency to preserve their export markets and really kick the can down the road in terms of dealing with the fundamental issues in our financial system. In that case, what role can gold and other precious metals play in an investor's portfolio? Well, gold can't be printed. It's not the obligation of any government. Uh, Unlike, you know, when when you hold a US dollar in your hands, it says there's the promise that the US government will deliver a dollar of value in return for that. But, you know, that can be debased as the printing presses um, are ramped up. And that's exactly what's happened, as I said, since the early 1970s. It's been a remarkable debasement of the value of that U.S. dollar. Uh, gold has a very finite quantity on the Earth's surface. Um, if you look at every ounce that's been mined since the beginning of time, it's about the equivalent of 200,000 metric tons. Um, and that would fill one Olympic-sized swimming pool. So it's a very finite quantity. And it can't be printed willy-nilly, it can't be created or mined willy-nilly. It it requires significant upfront capital investment, social license to operate, permits from governments. And that's why we've actually seen a steady decline in production globally. We only add about 2% to supply every year as an industry, and that's declining every year as, as production's declined because the industry has not been reinvesting in exploration back in the ground to replace depleting reserves. In fact, reserves in the ground over the last 10 years have gone down 40% because of the lack of reinvestment back in exploration um, because we had gone through a very long bear market for precious metals uh, over the course of the last decade. So the capital just wasn't there to conduct the exploration necessary to replace depleting assets. At Staples Business Advantage, our team of experts can help you find the break room products to satisfy everyone's preferences, while AI can suggest popular items, monitor stock levels, optimize pricing, and automate reordering. AI can do a lot of things, but I can never know the taste of a truly great cup of coffee. Sigh. But you also can't get hangry. This is true. Let Staples Business Advantage use today's latest innovations, plus our team's experience, to make stocking your team's break room easier for you. Sign up today and save 20%. Staples Business Advantage. Business is human.
So investors don't need to just buy physical gold. You don't have to have a safe and put your gold bars into that safe, do you? What are some of the ways that um, mm-hmm. investors can access the value of gold? Yeah, you, you're right. Physical is definitely a way to do it. And I think everybody should have some physical gold in their portfolio. I certainly do. And I do store it in my safety deposit box. And I think it's a, a very, very viable way to invest in gold. But of course, what that doesn't provide you is as much leverage as you might realize, say, in owning a mining equity, uh, a gold equity. And, you know, for example, if gold price went up 10%, and presumably the margins at the mine should go up disproportionately higher in a stable cost environment. But unfortunately, we're not in a stable cost environment. We're in a very inflationary environment, uh, unlike anything we've seen since the 1970s. And so mining companies are not immune from that cost inflation. So you're not getting that leverage to the gold price that you were hoping to in mining mining equities. That's why I think it's instructive that after 33 years of building and operating mines, I've now run a royalty vehicle. Uh, I really believe in the bull case scenario for gold, but I wanted to participate in the gold price rally and get that leverage without exposing myself to inflation at the mine site. And really, a royalty company provides that top line exposure while insulating you from the underlying operating costs at a mine. Okay, well, let's talk about mining royalties. How how do they operate? I mean, most uh, listeners might think of royalties as in terms of what an artist would receive on their music catalog, for example, Mm -hmm. or even a a pharmaceutical company. How does it work in the mining industry? Well, the model is very similar. We get a percentage of the gross revenue. And the reason we do that is quite often we're providing capital to the explorers, the developers and operators to help them grow their deposits geologically, build them, expand them. And we take a royalty back in return rather than expecting repayment. And that royalty is perpetual. It's adhered to the property for the rest of its life and any expansions in reserves geologically. So we get the benefit of the upside in the gold price and upside and expiration success. So if our operating partners conduct further expiration on their properties and grow their reserves, our royalties extend to those expansions and reserves. So we get the benefit of the expiration upside without having to contribute to their expiration budgets. So once we buy a royalty, we own it for life. In the case of Gore Royalty, for example, uh, my company, we own 216 royalties across the Americas, and they're completely bought and paid for. We never have to put another dime into them. And we get the benefit of the upside in the gold price because, again, full benefit because we're not exposed to operating costs. It's top line exposure. It's a percentage of the gross revenue from the mine. So we're not exposed to the underlying operating capital costs. And we get the benefit of the expiration that our operating partners conduct. Last year, for example, on our portfolio of 216 royalties, our operating partners invested $200 million in expiration on their properties. That was about 700,000 meters of diamond drilling for those that understand how drilling works. That's a lot of drilling. We didn't contribute anything to those exploration budgets, but as they grew the reserves, we benefited uh, in our royalty portfolio from that upside in the reserves. Can we just have a quick look at how a a mining operation works? Because they're quite capital intensive, obviously, and sometimes they're operating on a wing and a prayer or a, a geological report. What what is the life cycle of a typical mine look like? I know there's no typical mine, but <laughs> what does it look like? And then um, I guess what I'm trying to get to here is that capital is required and that mine operation can get that capital in many ways, one of which is via royalties yeah, or selling exactly. those royalties. Yeah. Exactly. No, and you're correct to question the life cycle of a mine, though, as you correctly point out. Many mines are different from each other, but the life cycle is broadly similar across all of the mines in the world. And it starts with early stage exploration, prospecting, uh, looking for properties that have geological potential. And there are many means of doing that, technical means of assessing the potential of a property and then finding geological targets to drill. And then that leads to hopefully discovery. In many cases, it doesn't. The success ratio is extremely low in the business. It's very, very risky. Um, And typically juniors, many juniors fail in their exploration efforts. I would say the vast, vast majority of them fail uh, because it is very difficult to find new mineralization in the ground in spite of very modern techniques to do so. And then once you actually have discovered something, if you're so lucky to have won the lottery and found that, that deposit, 
uh, then you have to delineate it geologically, uh, it, drill out the extent of it to really determine the size of the deposit. And then you have to engineer an economic case for it. And then you have to engage with the local communities, to get a social license to operate. And then you have to uh, cost out uh, the construction of a project, which can be in the many hundreds of millions or billions of dollars. The cost to entry in this sector is very, very high. And then you have to build it, uh, commission it, and then operate it cost efficiently. Um, and that can be quite uh, labor intensive and cost intensive as well, and energy intensive. 60% of our operating costs in the mining business typically are labor and energy. And with the kind of volatility we're experiencing in this sector, you can imagine the risk that uh, presents to the margins at a mine site. And, and I think, uh, again, that goes to my thesis to why you should buy a royalty company rather than an operating company. But typically from discovery, to first production, you're looking at 15 to 20 years. And that's many, many years of capital and exploration investment and social engagement and government engagement in order to get a license, uh, both economically, socially, and for that matter, from a government to actually build a mine and operate it. I think there's a good lesson in there in that um, I'm not sure what it's like in Canada, but you know, here in Australia and Canada, we've got um, very much uh, mining uh, intensive economies and you're always getting those tips about you know you should have a look at this gold mining operation you know it's going to be really good <laughs> and um, it just really goes to show how speculative these kind of tips can be and that beginner investors should avoid them precisely and, and in fact you know many of the junior explorers who do the grassroots exploration only have selective access to the capital quite often you know, the mm. markets open and close depending on whether the underlying commodity has momentum. And over the last decade or so, there hasn't been a lot of momentum in the precious metal sector. So by and large, the junior explorers who do all the heavy lifting that, you know, I talked about the early part of the life cycle being the most risky. They're the ones that do all the heavy lifting, take the, the most significant risk in their exploration efforts, but they only have occasional access to capital. And as a result of the lack of consistent access to capital, we've seen a 40% decline in reserves from their peak uh, since 2012 because the juniors mm. are the ones that do the discovery. The mining operating companies are the ones that, that build and operate. They don't tend to do the grassroots exploration, even though they have capital on the balance sheet to do that. They don't do it because the risk profile is so different from running the mine. And when you're a junior company, you embrace that risk. You're swinging for the fences, you know, as it were. And that's why <laughs> you have such a low batting average as a result. Whereas with mine operating companies, they're quite the opposite. They don't embrace risk. They mitigate risk because they take hmm. on a lot of capital intensity. They take on a lot of operational risk, safety risk, environmental risk. They're trying to engineer as much risk out of their business as possible. So typically operating companies are terrible explorers and explorers are terrible operators because the skill set's entirely different. So what role does gold royalty take in terms of providing capital for miners? We're, we go right across the risk spectrum and, and typically uh, we'll provide uh, some exploration capital to the early stage explorers, typically when they don't have access to capital as is, is currently the case. And so we take on for very low cost, some early stage bets on royalties on properties and sometimes we'll get mature operators approaching us because they have a very capital intensive uh, opportunity to build a mine or expand a mine that exists or is near production and we provide capital to them when they might not have access to capital uh, from traditional sources whether it's debt from banks or the equity capital markets might be depressed and it's very difficult for them to raise equity to fund the construction or expansion of their mine Sometimes we buy royalties from third parties. Um, you know, for example, a prospector might be looking to crystallize the value of a property he staked an expiration claim on. He sold it to an operator, he kept the royalty, and then he's decided, I'm going to cash in now. And we pick up a royalty that way as well. And sometimes we originate our own royalties. Uh, we have a small team um, in some of the best jurisdictions, Nevada, Quebec, and Ontario. And all they do is stake expiration claims around existing mines wait for the neighbors to knock on the door and say, my deposit's trending into your property. Can I buy your property? And we say, great, you can buy it, but we want a royalty back in return. And really? that's a very <laughs> cost-effective way to generate royalties because it just requires our sweat equity. And fortunately, with 400 years of collective experience within our 
a board of management, we have the expertise to do just that. So you really do that? You just stake out sites around existing mines and just wait and see, wait for someone to knock on the door. That's amazing. Yeah, exactly. You know, deposits don't know, know man-made boundaries, right? You know, ge- geology doesn't understand those those boundaries, those lines that we draw on a map. And so if we're selective enough about where we stake these exploration claims, and it's not very uh, costly to do so, nor to maintain those claims, we can be very patient. And then when we get those uh, royalties back in return, again, it just requires our sweat equity and they don't waste, they don't decay. Um, even if it's a long dated opportunity, we can just put it on the shelf, forget about it until somebody builds a mine there. And then we start to collect checks when the mine is built and operated. Just tell us a bit more about the history of gold royalty. How long has it been for when you started it and its growth? Well, we started it privately back in 2020. So uh, about two and a half years ago. Initially, with a collection of 18 royalties on the development stage assets of our former parent company, Gold Mining Inc. So we were royalties on their 18 development stage gold assets in the Americas, which collectively had about 32 million ounces of gold equivalent resource uh, across their property. So very significant mineral endowment. And having written those 18 royalties, we then IPO'd the company in March of 2021, raised $90 million U.S., Acquired a currency that we could then use to roll up some of our competitors. And we bought three peer companies over the course of 2021 and grew our royalty portfolio from 18 royalties to over 200 royalties as a result of that MA activity. It created scale quickly and it made us relevant in the royalty space very quickly, but also gave us a growth profile on the revenue side that's peer leading. We have 60% compounded annual growth in our revenue over the next several years, right through to the end of the decade. And that allowed us to actually introduce a dividend 10 months after our IPO. We pay now about a 1.9% yield. And with that revenue growth that we have and the fact that we have very flat costs, we only have eight full-time equivalent employees and we could run a business 10 times the size with the same number of employees given the simplicity of our business. That means that every incremental dollar of revenue falls right to the bottom line and increases the potential for us to grow our dividend over time. Mm, I was going to ask about the dividend. And so obviously this is a big part of the plan for investors is to provide a dividend for them. Yeah, it is. You know, at the end of the day, our business is a collection of annuities. You know, we have annuities on mines uh, that will pay for, we think, many, many decades. And that means that we have an annuity that we can share with our shareholders through, through a dividend. And so we introduced a dividend program quite quickly just given, again, how quickly we were able to scale our business up, given the depth of expertise we have within our business, um, that's given us a, an advantage, uh, given the, the seniority of our mining team, our board, in terms of accessing opportunities and very quickly executing upon them. I know one of the larger players in this space is a company called Wheaton Precious Metals. Is that correct? It is. What's yeah. the kind of what's the kind of comparison there between the companies between well, yours you know, and the, the landscape in the royalty space looks somewhat like this. There's three big players in the space: large caps, Franco Nevada, Wheaton Precious Metals, and Royal Gold. And they're trading at you know twenty to thirty billion dollar market cap, two to three times the net asset value of their underlying business. So very very rich multiples and richly deserved. They're large companies, mega caps with great portfolios, pay dividends really blue chip companies. And then there's a collection of smaller cap players uh, like Gold Royalty uh, that are starting to capture the imagination of the market, but trade at significant discounts to the seniors in the space. What's absent in the sector is a mid-tier company that's big enough to matter to institutional investors, but still small enough to grow. Because the challenge that the Francos and the Wheatons and the Royal Golds have at their scale is their inability to grow meaningfully. They're just too big. We're, you know, it's hard to imagine them going up five or tenfold, even in a rising gold price environment, whereas the smaller players that still have scale and have relevance given the quality of the portfolio, that provides them an opportunity to grow many fold uh, as the gold price appreciates. And we realize some of the value of our vast and underlying portfolio. David, you led the largest merger in gold mining history. Tell us about that. Yeah, I ran Gold Corp before I took over Gold Royalty, uh, which was one of the biggest producers in the world uh, based here in Vancouver. And we merged it with Newmont back in 2019 to create the world's biggest gold company by market cap and by production. 
And really that cannibalization in the sector, it continues to this day. Four short years after that merger, Newmont is proposed to take over Newcrest, another mega merger. It actually would eclipse the size of the merger that we uh, created back in 2019. And it's happening only four short years later because of the downward trajectory and reserves that I was talking about earlier on. It's down 40% as an industry from their peak in 2012. And because of the lack of investment and exploration in the ground, the industry just has to basically cannibalize itself in order to sustain it, the existing businesses. So that M&A activity will have to continue just out of existential necessity for some of the bigger companies in the sector. But it doesn't really create value because it doesn't find ounces in the ground. It just sustains really, really big businesses. And what we're doing actually creates value because we're putting money in the ground to help find new deposits, expand existing ones, and build new ones, and taking a royalty back in return and enjoying that upside in their exploration success of our operating partners, the upside in the gold price, while again, protecting you from cost inflation. So what's your view of the future for uh, the demand for precious metals? Well, I think it's quite robust. And, and the big drivers of that, I think, is the inflationary cycle we find ourselves in now. And there are many parallels uh, to this inflation cycle to the one we experienced in the 1970s. As I said, the US dollar was decoupled from the gold standard in the early 1970s to fund a war in Vietnam. Uh, similarly, the fiat currencies globally were decoupled from any backing as a result of the great financial crisis back in 2008. And that's resulted in a massive monetary expansion, very, very similar to what we had in the 1970s and perhaps more global in scale than it was in the 1970s. Um, and we have a war in, in Ukraine now. We had a war in Vietnam in the 70s and we had supply chain disruptions. We had an energy embargo back in the 1970s. We have an energy embargo today, self-imposed uh, this time, mm, self-imposed. And we're yep. not buying mm-hmm. Russian products, so there are very striking similarities uh, in this inflation cycle to what we experienced in the '70s. But I think this inflation cycle has the potential to be much worse for one significant reason: uh, the debt levels that we have globally at 350 percent of GDP today are three and a half times what they were in the 1970s at 100 percent of GDP. So, as you can imagine. When Paul Volcker assumed the reins of the central bank in the U.S. in the late 1970s, he had a lot more latitude to raise interest rates to tame inflation. In fact, that's exactly what he did, bringing interest rates to 20% against inflation of 14%. And by the early 1990s, he had slain the dragon and he brought inflation down to 2%, which we enjoyed for, for 20 years until the great financial crisis introduced new excesses into the system. And today, central banks can't hope to raise interest rates sufficiently to tame inflation because it would bankrupt governments. In the US alone, debt services doubled to a trillion dollars a year in the last 18 months. If interest rates went up another 200 basis points, it would double again. So today, we're standing at one out of every $7 raised in taxes is going to debt service. That's remarkable and shocking. And you can imagine there's very limited latitude, nor appetite for the central banks to really raise interest rates to tame inflation. With these debt levels, there's no fiscally responsible way for them to repay the debt. So they're going to have to inflate it away. They're going to have to debase the currency and by extension, debase the debt denominated in those currencies in order to make the debt go away and shrink it as a percentage of the economy. Many investors these days value sustainability in the companies they invest in. What are you seeing and what are you doing about um, the sustainability of the mining industry, which obviously uses a lot of resources to get these minerals out of the ground? No, no, absolutely. And and one of the things I did when I was running Gold Corp, a producer, uh, we built the first all-electric underground zero emission mine in the world um, in Ontario called Borden. And ironically, I've ended up with a royalty on Borden within the gold royalty portfolio just through by happenstance. And so I'm delighted that we have such a uh, such a high standard ESG uh, related uh, mine in some of the one of the best jurisdictions in the world. Uh, but look, the the industry um, has done a lot in terms of reducing carbon intensity, but also needs to do a lot of work on reducing water intensity as well. And I think they're making great strides in that regard. The technologies are improving every day and and being scaled every day. From a royalty company's perspective, there's a limit to what we can do. Obviously, when we own a royalty, we're a bystander. Uh, we collect the check. We can influence the day-to-day ESG practices. 
But I, I can tell you that there are many uh, opportunities that we've simply passed on uh, during our due diligence process because of a lack of high quality ESG practices, whether it's uh, safety, social engagement, environmental governance, where we didn't feel comfortable with the reputational risk that the operator brought. In, in fact, uh, out of the 250 opportunities we've looked at since our IPO two years ago, we've only executed on eight and we passed on about a dozen or so opportunities for ESG reasons. So we have very stringent criteria during the due diligence process that hopefully avoids uh, any reputational damage by getting associated with an operating partner that doesn't have the credibility to to, uh, conduct proper ESG practices. So how can listeners find out more about gold royalty and how can they access it as an investment? Sure. We're on goldroyalty.com, so very easy to remember. And we're G-R-O-Y-G on the NYC American. And again, we pay a 1.9% yield. We're a quite liquid stock on the NYC. Um, and we have the highest growth rate in the Americas uh, from some of the best assets in the Americas. We have a royalty on Canada's biggest producing gold mine, Canada's second biggest producing gold mine, and the biggest producing gold mine in the United States as well. David Garofalo, thank you very much for joining me today. Delighted to be here, Phil. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Stocks for Beginners. If you enjoy listening, please take a moment to rate or review in your podcast player or tell a friend who might want to learn more about investing for their future. At Staples Business Advantage, our experts can help you find furniture that fits any design and budget, while AI can recommend products based on preferences, generate 3D models for visualization, and optimize space planning for office furniture. Take advantage of our team's eye for style and design. And my eye for, wait, I have no eyes, only algorithms. At Staples Business Advantage, furnishing your office is easy. And with the best warranty in the business, we're committed to you now and down the road. Sign up today and save 20%. Staples Business Advantage. Business is human.